David Bowles with us. <laughs> How are you doing, David? I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's going to be a lot of fun. So David Boyles, you are like one of the local um, authors that has just produced some some awesome quality books, right? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to say that my books are not awesome quality. So, but yeah, no, I've I've put out more than a couple dozen books um, over the past decade and a half, and um, just trying to represent the nine five six in the literary world. First time I came came across your material, I was in San Antonio at a Barnes and nobles uh-huh. and they have a bunch of books and i was just walking by and i go oh my gosh there's ghost, this book called ghost of, the Gra- ghosts of the real grandy valley and i go oh my gosh there's there's someone that wrote a book about ghosts in the real grandy valley and i go I, I had to buy it so i bought it and i became a huge fan but i was also kind of upset too because i was like why doesn't the local barnes and nobles carry this book so i went down there to try to get an explanation why they did not have your book. Well, I think that whatever you said to them like paid off because I would say that now, especially especially the Barnes and Noble that's on Ware, but I think both of them, um, especially that book, they they carry my work. Um, and and I I usually am doing events at Barnes and Noble every six months or so. But yeah, there was a time when that was not the case. So I appreciate the advocacy. <laughs> You're like, I don't know who this David Bowles guy is, but he's from the Valley, so we gotta. You got to make sure his stuff is in the books. Exactly. Well, <laughs> what made you want to write Ghosts of the Real Grande Valley? Well, so I grew up in the valley. My my family's been here for generations on the Mexican American side. Mm-hmm. My family's been here for like a couple of hundred years in this region, you know, the 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 first of them came up with um Escandon in 1749 and settled in Camargo, Mier, Reynosa and then places north of the border ranches and stuff like that and um, eventually most of the the Mexican side of my family had come across in like by the 1880s into the valley. And then the Anglo side of my family came out of like Oklahoma during the Great Depression um, to come work in agriculture, like, you know, picking. I, I know it seems a little odd when we think about it in today's terms, but, you know, th- there was a grapes of wrath kind of thing happening where like n- people from Oklahoma and other places weren't just going to California. They were coming down to South Texas. So you had a a lot of white folks out in the fields. And so growing up, you know, over, obviously over the decades, those two families eventually merged. Um, mm-hmm. My uh, mom's parents weren't particularly happy that their, that their daughter was marrying a Mexican American boy, <laughs> but, oh, wow. they, but they graduated from McAllen in the sixties and, and a couple of years later out popped I. Um, and, you know, growing up down here, I've had the same experience that you have had and uh, so many other people you grew up with all these great leyendas, estos cuentos, you know, all the, the creepy cuckoos and, and, and stuff like that. And when I was a kid, um, like my like Uncle Joe Casas out on his ranch or my tias in their kitchens or especially my grandmother Garza, who was like the, the matriarch of the family and the storyteller, would like just fill my mind with all these stories, la, you know, La Llorona, Las Lechuzas, and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I just fell in love with with creepy stories. Um, and it's something that led me later to read like dark um, comics, like horror comics. Uh, I was really into DC. And so, you know, um, all of their anthology horror stories, any of their dark stuff. Um, I was mentioning to you before, like Swamp Thing and mm-hmm. just all these great, um, uh, like darker fantasy things. And and um, over time, I became a big reader and I just always wanted to find a way to bridge the gap between those two things. I love so much books and uh, like the, the scary cuentos of, of my family. And um, yeah, I mean, over time, I just realized that, that the best way to do it was to use one um, medium to preserve the other and retell the stories in my own voice for a modern audience and keep them alive for my kids. And like, I'm, I'm about to have my first grandkid in September, you know, keep, oh, wow. keep that alive for future generations. But you know, in my own way. And when you write something down, it takes on a different character. And how did you approach like writing the ghosts of the real Grande Valley? Like, how did you get your list of like, these are the stories I'm going to do? Yeah, no, it was hard. Um, so when the history press reached out to me, um, I, the, one of their editors had read uh, Border Lore, which is a, the book right before that. Um, that's also, it's got like um, maybe 25 different um creepy stories from South Texas and all the way up to even to the San Antonio area that had come out of, I don't remember I, if you remember, but I used to do a column for the, the McAllen Monitor called Creature Feature. And so 
Border Lore was like a like a collection of those different stories into one volume. Um, they reached out to me and said, we, ha- we have the series called uh, Haunted America, and we'd like you to do a volume for us on ghost stories in the valley. And, and I agreed. I said, but just with one condition, because I want to use it as a way to also talk about the history of the valley. Um, because I, I, I was a teacher. I, I still am a university professor, but I was a middle school teacher at the time, uh, middle school and high school teacher. And one of the things that I've learned is um, – it's like the whole a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down mm-hmm. that I found that with kids getting them interested in history was something that you could do if you if you embedded history in a, in a scary story. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach people about the, the history of the valley through these haunted stories. So I, I started coming up with a list and I basically started with what were the stories that scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. Right. Um, and I, I made that list up and, and then started talking to other people about like what story scared you. Um, and compiled a kind of longish list. They're super, there's a huge number of ghost stories in the valley. <laughs> and then started like thinking about which ones appealed to me the most, which ones would like be visually interesting if we, cause I, they wanted it to be, they wanted there to be photos and for it to be mm-hmm. illustrated. Um, and, um, and which ones were most connected to like valley history. So they would usually be a little bit older. Um, and, uh, and I wanted them to be more notorious as well. And also things that I hadn't already talked about. So, I mean, I had already done the double, the disco at Bocasio's 2000 and McAllen in, in 1979. And so I wasn't going to redo that one. I, and I wanted to keep to like, like creepy hauntings that mm-hmm. were tied to places where something had happened that was significant. So um, that's, that was really kind of the way I, I chose the stories. Yeah. yeah because it adds that, that extra that extra scare factor when you're like, I could drive to this place that you're writing about. I wanted, I, I totally wanted the book to also be like a travel log. Like here are 16 freaking scary places. Get in your car, go visit them. And there are people who have done it. There are people that use the book as like a tour guide to go to different places. And when you wrote Ghosts of the Rio Grande Valley, did, did you think it was going to be as popular as you thought it was going to be? You know, it's, it's always hard to tell. You never know with a book. I was hoping that at the very least it would be popular in the Valley, that there would be an appetite for that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I, and I was right. Um, but the book has also been successful outside of the Valley throughout Texas and other, other places because so many of the, the ghost stories are related to Mexican American identity. It, it resonates with Mexican Americans all over the, the Southwest as well. So it's, it, it's kind of cool, but yeah, when the book first came out, um, we did a book launch at the McAllen public library and we had set it up on Facebook and I, I tried to warn the people at the library, um, be sure that you're keeping track, be sure that you, you have a big space because this is, going to be popular and i'm looking at the numbers of people that are signing hey, up for it david you, you just should, thousands you, of people signing up and they're like you just should yeah. have told them i'm a rock star do yeah. you know i'm a rock star I was trying not to be too what's uh, the security going to be like <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 what, what's my green room going to look like <laughs> yeah. I take out all the green m&ms you know whatever yeah that kind of nonsense <laughs> um but they i don't they just weren't expecting mm, oh, because there's a real hunger for that and yeah. like we love our culture we love our stories mm-hmm. Um, we love our ghosts and, um, it, to me, it seemed pretty obvious that we were going to have a huge number of people and the the, the, the day of, there were so many people that the librarians were freaking out. They're like, Oh my God, David, we're not, we don't have enough space for all these people. We sold, I mean, a huge number of books. The, the book has been really successful for the, for a while. It was like my best selling book. I mean, I've now gone on to publish with traditional publishers with Harper Collins and Penguin Random House and so forth. And so I've broken those sales records, but for a while it was, you know, my most popular book and it continues to sell out constantly at Barnes and Noble. Yeah. So <laughs> every time I'm there, like we had to order another, you know, a hundred <laughs> copies of it. And I'm like, dang, that's, you know, it's kind of cool. Um, and it is, but you know, with it comes, I mean, we, we were, we were waxing sentimental about comic book heroes earlier, but it's the Superman. I mean, that Spider-Man thing where, um, you know, with great power comes great re- comes great responsibility. Yeah. And so because I have a platform now, because I have an audience, and because my books are winning so many awards and so forth, I have a responsibility to represent the Valley well um, and to be an advocate for other writers in the Valley. Um, and and so, so you know, I, I try to, to parlay my success into the success of other people as well. And just like a, a, a better... Mm, 
public understanding of what the valley's like, what the border is like, and undo some of the the misconceptions and misunderstandings about our culture. Those notions that we don't have roads down here, or that we don't have people with like fantastic talents. Yeah. And that's what made me feel really good about finding your book, not down here, but in, in, San, in San Antonio. It gave me such a, a sense of pride. Like, wow, there's someone in our area that's doing stuff like this and their work is spreading like everywhere. Yeah. So it was a good, a good feeling. Well, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm, what I want is for people to continue feeling that and for people to feel emboldened by that representation to then to tell their own versions of these stories or, or tell their own stories, uh, write their own books, uh, film their own movies, do whatever they want to do to get that creative voice out into the world that will show people um, who we are and showcase the talents and, and just wonderful um, cultural aspects of our region. So when you were writing this book, David, did you um, have to go to any of these scary places? I mean, I, I revisited a couple of them, um, although I did it during the day and, <laughs> <laughs> and usually very quickly. Like I, I, in an interview um, that I did uh, last year for Halloween, I was, went to the San Juan Hotel and was talking to... Um, uh, uh, Kaylee Garcia, I think her name is, right? We were chatting about the place before she started recording, and, and I told her, you know, I, I came into this building um, during the writing of the book, and it was the middle of the summer, and I went into some of those rooms, and, like, the temperature would just drop in some of them so that it oh, felt wow. like it was in the 70s uh, or upper 60s. And granted, like, the windows are boarded up and so forth, but it's the valley in the summer. You board up windows all yeah, you want. Yeah, it's going to be real hot. And so, like those little things made me like less, <laughs> less excited about going into supposedly haunted places. And so, what I did was, I, I, <laughs> I sent um, <laughs> Jay, the the illustrator, um, and his then girlfriend, who was the photographer, and had them go into these places. I'm like you, you younger people <laughs> in, their, in their early twenties, <laughs> you younger people go to these. <laughs> These places take pictures, um, update me on any, any changes because you can run faster. And you know, I'm, mm -hmm. an, I'm, I was in my um, early 40s or whatever, and I was like, I, I don't want to be running from spectral anomalies. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and David, what is your personal favorite story in Ghosts of the Rio Grande Valley? Well, I mean, it, it's really hard. Um, I guess the one that moves me the most is the story of the San Juan Hotel because it's tied to um, to injustice into this this period of time called La Matanza in around 1915 through a, a little bit before 1920 when lots and lots of Mexican Americans were lynched um, because of overzealous law keeping um, and rumors and paranoia. Um, and it to me it like resonates for the present because that kind of stuff it's so easy for it to unleash like you think it's not gonna happen it's not gonna happen it's not gonna happen until it happens and then you're suddenly like in the middle of it or on the other side of it um, with a lot of tragedy in in your wake and you know that's what happened when a hundred thousand uh, federalized state troop came to the valley and then there were a lot of field commissions for Texas Rangers and a lot of these frankly white men. Um, took it upon themselves to mete out justice yeah. summarily out on the much. field. Um, and it was, it was a really, really rough time. And it was all because of the, the Plan de San Diego, which was something written by Mexican nationals that hadn't even been dispersed through the Southwest. It was, they wanted to rile up people in the Southwest, Mexican Americans and indigenous people and black people um, to rise up against white people. But it, 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 there's there's no guarantee it would have happened. It was just their plan. It'd be kind of suspicious when you find a document written by two guys like in a bar someplace, right? Right, right. <laughs> that just cross over to McAllen and they're just like hanging out in a restaurant and like they happen to, I guess they, they mentioned it to, to some McAllen lawyer and he calls up, you know, the, the, the sheriff or whatever and he sends his deputy and it's that, that deputy, um, um, Tom Mayfield, whispering Tom Mayfield, um, who arrests the guy and, and then becomes later on, gets a field commission as Texas Ranger and like kills all these people um, in the Alamo City Park, um, and, you know, hangs them, shoots them, burns them, <laughs> buries them wow. in unmarked graves. It's really messed up stuff, mm -hmm. which is what people believe is 
part of the haunting of, of that hotel is that the spirits of these people that were wronged, um, especially wronged by Tom uh, Mayfield, uh, inhabited that place. And he lived there until the end of his life and his waning years after um, first being disgraced in Texas and then going to Mexico um, as a bodyguard for, for the American Petroleum Company and um, like having to go before a firing squad for breaking Mexican law mm-hmm. um, and, and like killing people in Mexico um, and then escaping and coming back to the U.S., but not before getting his throat slashed in the cantina for talking smack about Mexicans. <laughs> so you got to like question the sanity of this <laughs> yeah. dude, right? Um, and that's really, one of the things that really disturbs me about the San Juan Hotel is the the plaque on the outside of it, like the historical plaque. is. Mm-hmm. It's like it elevates all that. It's like, oh, ha, 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 he escaped from the firing squad in Mexico as if, as if to say Mexican justice is clearly... Is different, yeah. Savage and base and... Not like American, not like white justice. Mm-hmm. So, oh, of course he escaped from those brown people down south. It's just really, really gross. And like a lot of us have tried to get changes, have tried to get that um, that plaque taken down, have tried to get the, the park named after him, renamed and so forth. But when there's not justice in the world, Efrain, what happens is um, la gente crea su propia justicia, right? That's what's happened, is that people tell stories about his soul being tormented. The reason it's being haunted, the reason that place never stays open, the ancianos say, is that the, his soul is in there being tortured for the rest of eternity by the souls of the people that he, you know, killed. Tortured, um, right? and, and so, you know, putting aside whether that's true or not, just that idea of, like, justice being served even when the world is unjust unjust yeah it's, it's 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 cool and that kind of stuff like really really gets my attention and it's also just a freaky weird place to be <laughs> <laughs> you go and you're looking at it you peer on the windows and it just feels like desolate and wrong like it's bent somehow mm-hmm. um and uh whatever the reason is it's you know you know in, in our lifetimes how many times have they tried mm-hmm. opening that thing up you know um that I know in the 52 years that I've been alive, they've tried to open it up four different times and it's closed down every time. Um, some people might argue it's a bad location, but maybe it's something worse, right? Maybe something worse, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, here's a very controversial question, David. Ooh. It's super controversial, right, right, so, right. so so get ready. Oh, no. Do you believe in ghosts? Oh. <laughs> um, I will admit to being a skeptic about the existence of ghosts because I haven't encountered one. And so... It's just one of those things where until you see it yourself, um, until it happens to you, it, it's, it's I think, better to be reserved in your judgment and to say, I'm not going to discount the possibility altogether. But what matters to me more than the existence of the ghost is like what's implied by the fact that we tell ghost stories because we tell ghost stories for reasons. Like what are we, what are we trying to encode? What are we trying to remember? What do we want to pass down? Like you think about the story of La Llorona, one of the most famous ghost stories of all time that exists in thousands of different varieties. Every town has their own Llorona and every town it was in that lake or in that canal oh, yeah. or in, the, in that river that, that she drowned her children. Um, because the purpose of the story is to say something about the relationship between men and women and between parents and children and like how fragile that is and how important it is to preserve it and to have respect for the people in your family and how easily it is when that, that respect um, is upturned for everything to unravel. Um, uh, In in other words, it's like a warning. Don't, don't screw around on your wife. (laughs) She will (laughs) drown your children. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I mean, it sounds really brutal, but it it is, it is kind of like a warning. Like you have got to treat people with dignity or you can be unleashing something really horrifying. And and since writing ghosts of the Rogandi Valley, have any people like ever uh, approached you as like being the the ghost like expert? (laughs) Uh, yeah, unfortunately for them, I I got um, I I get all kinds of emails and messages, and, and especially in the, the the years immediately after its publication, I got a lot of people writing to me and saying things like, "I think I have a ghost in my house, and I need to know what to do." And I'm like, <laughs> I I'm a writer <laughs> and a professor, um, and I guess maybe kind of like a armchair historian or chronicler of local lore 
Um, I don't know what you should do, <laughs> but I will tell you what I would do. I would go if if I if I belong to a particular like religion, I would go to a clergy member of my religion, or I would go to a to like a curandera or a santero or somebody somebody that had a under, better understanding of those things than I did to seek help. Um, and you know, and then I just like recommended a couple of names that I had heard for them to go look at. Um, because I'm the wrong person to come to for advice. I mean, uh, yeah. but yeah, people do ask me for advice. They they want to know what to do, and um, I, you know, I try to tell them something because I don't want to like just ghost them. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good one. That's yeah. a good the exorcisms one. and sage. I think that's the wrong way to go. I think the right way to go, especially now nowadays, David, is to put the property on Airbnb and to promote it as make a, a lot of money. <laughs> This is exactly what the, the owners of La Board House have done. Yeah. They like play that up. They're like, I'm going to stay in the red room where this woman killed herself and, and it reappears. Uh, that'll be, you know, 125 bucks a night. So come yeah, on. Yeah. And th there's in the Ghosts of the Rio Grande Valley, you also mention the hotel in McAllen, Las Palmas. Las Palmas, yeah. Right. And I'm. There's now people like you get on YouTube and there's people that are, are spending money to, to stay there mm -hmm. and go um, ghost hunting. Yeah, yeah. And there's all, it's the same thing with the Colonial Hotel in Brownsville. So, I mean, people enjoy that sort of thing. There is, you know, for a certain type of person, there is a, um, a level of excitement of, of you know, genus equi. There's like this extra thing about staying in a place that's purportedly haunted. Um and you know more power to them, but I, I think I think that's really good advice. Like, we live in a capitalist society, guys. <laughs> Turn your haunting into money, profit from it. Especially nowadays with the, what you know with this gig economy we have. Yeah, make it an NFT. Yeah. Make the ghost an NFT. <laughs> Take a photo of the ghost. And David, so is ghost of the Rio Grande Valley? Is that your your final ghost book, or are you going to update it or have a new one come out? It, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where um, in those early years of my writing career, like the first five years um, between um, the the series of Strange Texas Tales That Never Die, um, Border Lore, um, Ghosts of the Rio Grande Valley. I mean, I, I, I did like a half dozen books that were about haunting stuff like that. And I suspect I'll eventually come back to those things, but my career in and like writing fiction um, has really taken off. And, you know, I've, that's what publishers want from me right now. Um, when I was an indie writer um, publishing with university presses or small presses, um, you know, I, I was doing what was, what, what people wanted and what I felt compelled to do. Um, but now things have taken a, a different turn, but I suspect that I'll eventually come back to it. It, it you know, it's, it's, fun stuff to write but i do continue to like embed that kind of stuff in all of my other work um you know most of what i write is for like young people but nearly everything even a book like this the, they call me Guero, which is about you know like se the seventh grade year of a boy in south texas um in it he has stories oh i actually opened it to the page of la mano pachona so, I mean, he does, like, have an obsession with, with cuckoos and monsters. And, and then I have this series, also set in South Texas, now, about Three Cousins. Yeah. Now, they call, they call me a muero. Muero. That yeah. book has won some serious awards, right? Yeah. I mean, it won the Tomas Rivera Mexican-American Children's Book Award. It got the Pula Bell Prey Author Honor. Um, it got um, the, uh, you know, a couple of poetry awards. And, um, yeah, I mean, it won me about 10 different awards and the sequel they call her Fregona is coming out in September and so we're all crossing our fingers Penguin Random House publishes it and they're obviously hopeful that uh, it will be as successful um, but it shows to me first of all like having the word Wedo in the title of a book and having it become like a success in the US and it's like in its seventh printing um, is 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 rewarding to me it's like just throw a word that no non-spanish speaker <laughs> no. can speak they're like G -g what did they just um and i always tell them just say the word meadow and change the m to a w so you're saying widow and that's, that's close enough um and that makes people very happy but the book has been incredibly successful um 
as has um, my 13th Street series, which is about three cousins from South Texas who find them. It's kind of like I pitched it as like Stranger Things for kids ages five to nine. So it's like these kids, Mexican American kids who get transported into uh, an alternate world where it's just like one street that goes on forever um, and it's populated by monsters. And so a lot of the monsters that they have to face off against are like embedded in Mexican American lore. Um, but that, the other thing that I've been doing is going off on, on slightly different tangents. Um, one of my major interests is the valley's roots in Mexico and Mexico's roots in like pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. Mm-hmm. And so I, I've done a lot of stuff working with Aztec and Mayan uh, uh, mythology, like this book, Feathered Serpent, Dark Heart of Sky, um, which launched some adaptations in graphic novel form. Like the, here's the first one. Uh, Rise of the Halfling King. This series actually is illustrated by my daughter, so it's a lot of. Cool, it's really cool to to work with her um, in these things. And then, like I do, like this this other series uh, called Clockwork Curandera, which is like an, mm, you know, what steampunk is right. This is like yeah. steampunk, but set in the valley um, in northern Mexico in in an alternate 1865. And this is illustrated by Raúl González Raúl the Third. Um, and it's just really, really fantastic. And, and in fact, we just, oh, wow, got, that is neat. just got nominated for um, uh, a, uh, what is it called? The Locus Awards for Best Illustrated. And I, and I just got news that next week I, they're going to announce another pretty significant nomination. Anybody who knows anything about graphic novels and comics might know what I'm suggesting. I can't, like, officially say it, but I can imply. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Um, and you, so you can see, I mean, the, the variety of things that I'm writing now going from originally like retelling legends and myths um, to like now having novels and, and graphic novel series and so forth. And, and then of course my children's book that came out um, last year, my two border towns, which has also won a bunch of awards. Um, oh, my, my two border towns. That, that sounds like, like a very interesting title. What's that about? So my two border towns is just, it's about this kid um, here in deep South Texas who goes with his dad um, every couple of weeks to visit um, the uh, the town on the other side of the river from them? It's it's basically it's a fictionalized version of like Westlaco and and Progreso um, to visit family members and um, to buy things. Their mom always gives him a list. His mom always gives him a list. Um, but they, they they we follow them as they go into. No Progreso, and they buy all this stuff. Here's like oh, the streets wow. of No Progreso, like kind of folded out. And they're buying things, and the kid is like thinking about um, his friends that he wants to give stuff to. And at the very end, um, as they're coming back across, we find out who it is that, th- that the, these, all these uh, supplies are for, and it's for the asylum seekers, the refugees that are camped out on the bridge. Oh, wow. Because it was inspired... Um, Back in um, 2017 and 2018, what do you think played a role in your success in being a successful writer? Well, I mean, I, I always attribute my my abilities as a writer or my desire to be a writer to the stories that were told to me when I was a kid, and then the fact that I learned to read when I was really young because I was a really annoying listener of stories. So when my grandmother got to would gather. And my primos and me together, um, especially after she and my grandfather Manuel divorced, she was living in um, a trailer park in South McAllen. I don't know if anybody who's listening remembers, but um, right next to La Plaza Mall where that hotel is, there used to be oh, yeah. lived. And so they we get dropped off on Saturday. And I was like, you know, I was like a little kid. We get dropped off for free baby uh, babysitting there. It was all like, ay, pobre anciana, she needs her nieto so that she won't be so lonely. And it was this free babysitting, right? <laughs> uh, and, and she would tell, like, incredible stories. But I always wanted more. I always had questions afterward, you know. Mm-hmm. If a lechuza took a little kid and flew off with him, I was like, Wellita, what happened to the to the boy later on? Did, did Does his parents call the police? Is there, like, a special squad that hunts down cuckoos? And my girl was like, <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> said him. And so, um, the imagination's just going. Yeah, my, yeah, yeah. And so, and I always had so many questions, and I wanted more stories. And there was a day where she was just like, I don't, know, I don't have any more stories to tell you. If you want answers to your questions, if you want more stories, you're going to have to learn to read because it's in books that you find that stuff. 
And so I was like, oh, okay, well, teach me to read. She's like, no, 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 tell your mom to teach you to read. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I told, I, got, I bugged my mom until she taught me to read. And, you know, by the time, I, before I entered kindergarten, I had learned to read. Um, and it really changed things for me. Um, and then I had some really great librarians uh, in elementary who, like, pointed me in the right direction and took my interest in scary stories and comics and pointed me at books that would, like, deepen my interest in literature and just gradually, you know, I got guided by all the, the right people in the right direction. Um, and by the time I was in um, junior high at Lincoln in McAllen, um, the great um, Bill Hetrick, a wonderful teacher who died a few years ago, unfortunately was hit by a car when he was jogging one morning and died well before his time. Uh, he's the one who kind of pulled back the lid on poetry for me because to me, poetry is like, whatever, that's for girls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and he's the one who showed me like just how super cool poetry could be. And that's really when I started writing. And before that, I had like told a lot of stories and had imagined and, take, and made notes on fan fantasy and science fiction books I wanted to write. But at, when I understood poetry, that's when I began to write. And then um, I, I wrote my first novel when I was 17 at PSJA High School. Oh, and, wow. Um, there was a novel writing contest that Avon books put on for teens. And I wrote, um, I was really into Hitchhiker's Guide to the Gal Galaxy at the time. And so I wrote like, this, Oh, great book. This, yeah, it's great, a great series. And I, um, I wrote just like a knockoff of that kind of stuff, like a humorous, um, science fiction story about a light skinned Mexican American boy, um, <laughs> with an Anglo last name <clears throat> who, uh, yeah, who goes on these galactic adventures. And, um, I didn't win, needless to say, but I had written a book, and it was really like this empowering thing, like, damn, I could do this. Mm -hmm. um, and um, But it was, you know, I also came to to understand that I had a vocation for teaching as well when I was in uh, college and, and when I met my wife and so forth and tried to figure out what to do with my life. Um, I had had some good teachers who guided me, but also had had a lot of really bad teachers. Oh, yeah. And I yeah. wanted to be like the good teacher who guided mm -hmm. kids. And, um, and, and so I, you know, I got my degree at, um, UT, uh, PA. Um, and as I started my master's, I started teaching and started doing this, the stuff that I called, um, ethnographic research. And I got kids to, to do what I was doing for them. I mean, the kids didn't want to read the books, the stories that were in the textbook. So I would retell these stories that my grandmother had told me, um, and, and write them up as short stories and mm -hmm. dialogues. Like, and kids would love it. They, and so I taught them to do the same thing, how to, to go back to their family member that had told them the story, hear the story again, and then retell it, um, but in their own voice and with all of the tools of like literary work. Um, and it was just a really just enlightening thing. And, and that's when I realized that that's what I wanted to do. Um, and my first book, The Seed, um, Stories from the River's Edge, was a collection of stories half of which I had written with my students doing that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of retellings of, of local legends in that first book. And then, you know, I went on to do, um, the Mexican Beastery, which is a, like a encyclopedia of Cucuy's from Mexico and from the U S Southwest. And then to do border lore and it goes to the Brigand Valley and the, the Texas tales that never, that Texas, that's like Texas tales that should, Shall not die or what I can't remember. It was like mm -hmm. a ripoff of that, of the Juan Sobajo uh, series. Um, these tales that, oh wow! Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we, um, it was a lot of fun putting those together, and and um, and then I I helped edit uh, Juan Sobajo's um, like you know the, the three big books into a series of s individual or smaller books that that collected the stories individually. Yeah, because he had so much material. Yeah, he did have a lot. So I was lucky to work with that because that's one of the, the, the books that I used um, when I was teaching middle school before I began to, to tell the stories myself. My friend Javier Garza, who now is also a great writer and illustrator on his own, own right, he was the, the art teacher across the hall from me um, there at um, AP Solis Middle School and Donna, and we were always working putting our heads together, trying to figure out ways to reach these kids. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who turned me mm -hmm. on to, to Juan Sobajo's work, and I photocopied the hell out of that book because you couldn't get it anywhere in the mid-'90s. Yeah, really hard. it was hard. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, those are all, like, the influences, I think. Um, and I just continue to try to do work that centers our region, centers Mexican-Americans, mm -hmm. or our roots in Mexico, mm -hmm. or Mexico's roots in pre-Columbian mm -hmm. Mesoamerica. And I have... Lots more stuff coming down the pipe. I have 
you know, the sequel to, to Wero coming out this year. I have the the, follow, the following books in my graphic novel series coming out. I've got um, some YA novels now, coming out next year. It's a, now, a lot of stuff coming out. Now, if you can tell us, David, uh-huh. if you can, I can or, or, or can't. That I will tell you whatever you want to know. Tell us. But are any of your your books or works, are they being considered or in the process? Or are, are you considering... Um, adapting like any of your books to film or or animation or anything like that yeah so um so border lore was options um a long time ago like six years ago by mucho mas media uh, a production company out of hollywood that is actually run by a, a, a valley native um, javier chapa who is actually a lawyer he studied law and but then decided to be to start a production company in hollywood the smart guy yes he was <laughs> gonna practice law um, and he and I have been working together for many years. Right? We tried to get it off the ground as um, as a live action series. It would be like an anthology series, like mm-hmm. a like a Tales from the Crypt kind of thing. Um, and we were um, it, th- that was almost successful. But then uh, we were gonna we had a lot, lots of interest from El Rey from the network El Rey, mm-hmm. um, and Robert Rodriguez was was down for it. And things looked like it was, they asked us to make changes to make it a little bit more like Black Mirror. And so we adjusted it. We had a showrunner. We had scripts. We had all the funding oh, in place. Right. And then El Rey went through this like restructuring in it, and then that deal didn't happen. No. But we've tried to make it happen a couple of ways, but right now, um, last year they re-upped the option, and it is um, in kind of in development as a possible animated series. So mm-hmm. it would be a really cool like oh, animated that'd, series. That'd be really neat. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I continue working with with mucho mas on trying to get other projects off the, the ground. So yeah, I mean, I am. It's definitely something I want to see happen. And, and I've um, worked in Hollywood and collaborated on scripts. I was um, deeply involved in this um, miniseries that was going to be made by Amblin and Amazon about. Uh, Cortez and Moctezuma and you know the Spanish invasion. Of, oh, that, oh, that would have been so it cool. Was, it was going to star Javier Bardem as Cortez and Tenoch Huerta as uh, Moctezuma. It was just amazing. And I got to work on the scripts and um, film it in Spanish and in Nahuatl mm-hmm. with just English subtitles. And so I was the script translator. I translated the scripts. That was so much fun. And like it was just so great to meet all these guys and um, – to sit at the same table with Javier Bardem and these guys. It's yeah. like a little, you know, you get stars in your eyes or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it was a lot of fun and it made me realize that that, that is something that I want to see happen. I mean, I have a great career as a writer and I don't need to go into Hollywood, but well, I would love to see our stories on translated yeah. translated onto the screen. Now, what, what I've learned, David, is although you write all these books transitioning these books into an actual script that's like a different form of writing right? it is it is totally different form um because i mean down to the program you use to write the script to just the way scripts are put together um you're you're telling the story in a very different way that's that's the hinges on dialogue um but also like stage directions and things like that so it's um it's something that i had to learn to do i love that though i loved learning new things like when i first wrote my first graphic novel script the same thing it's very different from writing a page of prose or a series of poems um but i love that challenge and it's 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 really really great and i've been doing some work on some other tv shows like victor and valentino on the cartoon network um working as a cultural expert and in, in, in story um consultant um on because it's it's a show it's kind of like gravity falls but with like like Mexican Americans and like Aztec gods and stuff like that. So it's it's mm-hmm. it's really cool. If anybody's never seen it, they ought, they ought to check it out. Um, but yeah, no, I have a real thirst to do that sort of thing. And you know, right now, mucho mas media um, and and I, along with um, Hector Rodriguez, who's a comic creator, he created El Peso Hero, um, have launched a, a, a like an imprint, a Latinx imprint of comics with Scout Comics, which is one of the bigger indie distributors of comics in the u.s and we're gonna like roll out like a bunch of latinx comics um in the next year so it's definitely something you know i'd like to dabble in all of these different worlds and try to get projects pushed through um there's such a like a a a need for mexican-american stories latinx stories more broadly uh in every single one of these media 
Uh, and so anything I can do to help that happen and to promote other people's stories or my own stories, whatever, I, I'm there. Um, and uh, it means I keep really freaking busy. <laughs> well, David, thank you for doing what you're doing. And we're, I think we're all looking forward to seeing all of your future projects. And thank you for making us that live down here very, very proud. It's a delight to represent this area. And thank you so much for inviting me to the program.